Welcome back, guys, to the Grateful Living Podcast. I am uh, fortunate to have Kalia Johnson here with me today. Uh, Kalia is a former women's um, ice ho- professional ice hockey uh, player and uh, was also a Division I hockey player at Boston College. Um, Kalia, uh, thank you for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk to you a little bit. Awesome. Uh, so let, let's bring it. Let's bring it back to the beginning. Um, talk to me about um, maybe where you grew up, um, your family situation, and what type of kid you were, and, and things of that nature. Yeah. So um, I'm originally from Los Angeles, California, in the Inglewood area. Um, I lived there until I was about ten years old. Um, from there, we moved to uh, an area called Chandler, Arizona. It's right outside of Phoenix. Um, it's about 20 minutes. Um, I started playing hockey at a very young age. I started playing because of the Mighty Ducks movie. Um, I saw it when I was like two or three and I wanted to start skating and I haven't stopped, well, recently stopped um, since when I was two. Um, I grew up with a brother and a sister, both older, six years older. Um, brothers adopted, um, sister was a uh, god sister that lived with us, um, and a single uh, mom household, so it was just, I'm legally, I guess you could say, the only person that's blood related to my mom, but um, I grew up with siblings, and they were in the household and everything. Um, as a kid, I was doing everything. Uh, my mom had me in all sorts of sports. She was um, a former college basketball player as well as professional as well um, overseas. And so she had me just anything and everything from golf to tennis um, to basketball, of course. And then um, I picked up ice hockey. Um, Yeah. So when I moved to Arizona, I continued to play ice hockey um, for my team in California. So I did a lot of traveling going back and forth and um, I was really dedicated at a young age um, because I loved the sport and I loved the way it made me feel when I was skating around and all that stuff. So, yeah, it was all over the where, place, but rumba. Where in California did you grow up? Los, um, Inglewood, California. Okay. What was that like? Um, what was the environment like? Um, it was interesting. I, I mean, I loved my house and everything about it. I loved my elementary school. Um, I did not attend the local elementary school there. My mom ended up um, sending me to a charter school that she used to teach at um, because she wanted me to get a better education. Um, Inglewood is about, I want to say maybe 10, 15 minutes from Compton. So I was very much, I guess you could say in the hood. Um, And so, I mean, there's, I was surrounded by a lot of black families, a lot of black people, which was great. Um, but then I went to school where there wasn't um, that many black families. It was a very diverse school, I will say that. Um, but my living situation was a little bit different than school, I would say. Were you aware of that difference at that young age? I mean, we're, you know, you're only 10, but were you aware of that? Yeah. Um, in terms of school, no. Um, I think my mom did a, an amazing job of raising me to just to love everyone and not see color. Um, especially because I am a black person and other people do view me that way. Um, in terms of when I was playing hockey, I was very much aware of the fact that I was essentially in a white man's sport. Um, and I was very often the only black person on my team as well as the only girl on my team um, until I started playing girls hockey when I was about uh, eight. But before that, I was um, the only girl on my team. And then um, the only black person on my team. I think the first um, kid that I ran into that was um, my color, in a sense, was when I moved to Arizona um, and I was 12. Um, I started playing um, with this boy, Lucas, that was from New York who moved to Arizona. Um, and so, but it's very, very rare that you run into someone that's not only black, but a minority. At, at a young age, um, were you only playing hockey or were you playing other sports? I was playing other sports. Um, hockey was definitely my love, but I was still involved with basketball. Um, I was also running track for a little bit in soccer up until um, middle school, and that's when I kind of focused only on hockey after that. Gotcha. And then, at, so at around 10, you moved to Chandler, Arizona? 
Yes. Yeah. Talk about talk about that transition as a young kid. I'm sure you lost. You were feeling like you lost your friends and yes. things like that. Um, yeah. It was definitely. Uh, like, go ahead. Sorry. What did you say? But, uh, and what was Chandler like compared to, you know, California? Yeah, it was a little different. Um, very much different. It was. We Chandler isn't as diverse, um, especially in the school district that. I moved into, um, and so it was. It was a big change weather-wise in the surroundings um, with my friends. I no longer saw as many black kids. Um, I did see some, a few minorities that traveled in um, into my school. There was a few kids that came from the Indian reservation, um, which was great to see. And I made really good friends with this um, one kid, Tree, who we talked about. We talked often about how he would spend hours in the morning just getting to school, um, taking public transportation. And so um, it was definitely an adjustment um, in terms of surroundings, but I got used to it. I think playing hockey definitely helped um, because I was already in that environment. So when it came to adjusting the rest, it was it was fairly easy transition in a way. Um, I was sad to leave my friends and to leave my community, especially um, the school that I went to at um, Open Charter School was actually a school that my mom used to teach at. Um, and so I knew all the teachers there. I knew the students there. So adjusting and going to a brand new school where I didn't know anyone was a little tough. Um, but I was a kid and made friends pretty easily. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Talk to me a little bit about your mom and, and, and her being a single mom. I mean, how um, aware of that were you um, or were you not at a young age? I mean, and, you know, seeing, you know, maybe all of your classmates might be coming from two parent household, like, households. Um, was that something you recognized at a young age or did it take at an older age? Were you able to appreciate it more? Um, I definitely recognize it at a very young age. Um, I had seen my mother go through a lot of struggles, especially in middle school when we moved to Chandler. Um, I know that she moved us there for me and to make sure that I had a better, better education and that I wasn't sadly just another statistic in a black neighborhood. Um, I know that she was doing that to protect me, um, but I was very aware of the fact that I came from a single parent household um, when it came to access to certain things with money or just like being able to do things, I had to, you know, it's hard to juggle um, three kids and being the only one there. Um, and so I think I personally struggled a lot with the fact that there wasn't a father figure around. Um, my brother and sister, like I said, are six years older than me. So they knew my father. Um, and so they were able to have that relationship with him. And that was something that I wasn't able to have. And that was his choice not to be a part of my, my life. And so I definitely struggled with that a lot. Um, in middle school, I was able to meet him. Um, and we had a conversation. And after that, I decided that after seeing my mother struggle um, financially and the fact that he wasn't willing to pay child support and he wasn't willing to be there and, whatever capacity that he could um that i just didn't think it was right or fair um to invite him into my life after my mother and i had been through so much um so i was definitely aware of it at a young age but i think it shaped me into who i am and just seeing how strong my mom was and um just getting through everything and i mean just having to go live at a, a friend's house and seeing her go through that, I know that took a lot on her pride. So um, I learned a lot from my mother and the fact that she was a single mom. And I think it's um, made me the person who I am today. That's awesome. Um, talk to me a little bit more about, so you're, you're spending middle school and high school uh, in Chandler, Arizona. Um, was there a point at which you were like, man, I, I'm pretty good at this hockey thing? Or what was that like? Yeah, so um, middle school was great because I was able to work out a situation with the school in terms of like um, my PE was going to the ice rink and doing my what they refer to as independent PE. 
So every Monday and Wednesday morning, I'd go and skate and do a private lesson, and then I'd show up to school later in the day. Um, so I always missed the first two periods of school. And so um, when that point came and that my mom was able to make that sacrifice um, for me to really pursue my dreams, um, I think that's when it started to change for me. And then moving into high school, I asked my mom, I was recruited to a private school, or prep, private school in Vermont, um, which we sat down at a restaurant and I, we laid out the pros and cons and I really wanted to go, but I was only a freshman. And so uh, we met in the middle, I moved back to California. Um, I lived with a teammate and their family and I went to the local high school there so I can continue to play with my team in California and um, still play competitively um, girls hockey because girls hockey in Arizona wasn't that um, built out, I guess you could say. They were still in the building stages and they've gone gotten so much further now. They're very competitive, um, but at the time they were still kind of figuring it out and getting people um, engaged in hockey and California had already taken that step. So I moved back to Laguna Hills um, to live with a, a former teammate and a good friend, Annie Pankowski um, and her family. And so after that, we reassessed my freshman year and I was able to then um, go and live at the prep school in Vermont. Um, and so it was a really interesting high school because I was only there for the hockey season, um, which was September to March. Um, so I would start in this point, I was back in Arizona. Um, so I would start high school in Arizona. Um, I would then leave in September to go to Vermont for the hockey season, continue my education there, um, and play hockey 24 seven. And then I'd come back and finish school in Arizona after March. So I technically have a degree, um, from, uh, Corona del Sol in Tempe, Arizona, um, which is a local high school but um, I was probably their equivalent of a year if you add up all the months. Yeah. Um, so it was a very interesting uh, experience, but I, I definitely learned a lot about myself and I became very independent um, because of the fact that I was moving across the country and there was, um, the school had enough for two hockey teams. So it was 40 girls. We lived in a renovated lodge and they took care of us and fed us every day. We'd, we'd go to school it was almost like private tutoring um, in the mornings and then we'd go play hockey and work out for the rest of the day. And um, it was a great time and I wouldn't change it for the world, but I wouldn't say I necessarily had a, a normal high school experience. Um, but I definitely at that point became, moving in from middle school to high school when I moved to back to California, it became very serious for me. Yeah, talk about um, maybe, you know, like, you know, for a person that, is growing up loving basketball. Obviously, there's a lot of basketball role models, like, you know, mm -hmm. LeBron James or, and people like that. At that time, were there any role models for you um, in, in the women's hockey um, space? Or, I mean, did you follow more men's hockey? Um, that's a great question, a really interesting question. A lot of people ask me, like, who's my favorite player and who's my favorite team? I never really saw myself in anyone um, that was playing hockey, so I never really attached to anyone or a specific team. Um, and so I was just motivated for myself to, to um, follow my goals and my dreams was to go play Division One ice hockey, and that was what I was focused on. Um, so I didn't necessarily have a role model. Um, there were people that I aspired to play like and to be like. Um, but it wasn't always just in hockey. Um, I think I loved Jackie Robinson's story. I was number 42 in hockey for a very long time, um, up until I got to college, actually. And so um, that was kind of, I looked at more of that and who people were and how they carried themselves within their sport and their dedication, rather than just like looking for a role model in hockey, um, because I didn't have one. Um, and there wasn't any representation at the time um, for another black female athlete. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, the locker room and, and, you know, just, you know, uh, you know, how, you know, being one of the only black hockey players, probably time after time when you're playing against opponents and 
and things like that on the rink, you might be the only one. Mm -hmm. Um, How aware of that were you? Were there any incidents um, where you just fell out of place? Yeah, um, I was very aware of it. I think when I was younger, I was more aware of the fact that I was the only girl. Um, And then when I moved into women's ice hockey, um, I was even more aware of the fact that I was the only um, black person and often the only minority. Um, And it actually um, sadly wasn't until I got to college and I was a freshman, I was able to play with Blake Bolden. That was the first time I'd ever, um, I knew of Blake before then about when I got into high school and started looking at colleges, but that was the first time that I had the opportunity to play with another black female. Um, and so I kind of latched onto her like a little sister. Um, she gracefully took on the role. Um, I'm sure I was very annoying. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the locker room, I, it was, there were certain things that I, I noticed about myself that I didn't see in other people, whether that was my hair or the fact that like, I couldn't wear my hair the same way that other hockey players do, or the fact that I like had like this long of a ponytail coming out of my helmet because I have like basically a fro if I don't take care of it myself. Um, So there were some things that I noticed. It wasn't everything that I necessarily paid attention to. Um, It actually wasn't until college and that after Blake left, I realized I was like, oh, I don't have this person with me anymore. And so now I'm back to the only black person. I'm starting to recognize that um in college and just being the only black female on my team was um a little lonely um after Blake left um I felt like Blake and I had a bond in terms of like we just understood each other um and then after she left um I I did have a very good relationship with my other teammates but I just felt like it was never going to be on that level um and so to answer the second part of your question, there there were times where I did experience um, some negativity towards the fact that I was black um, from other um, teams, and it was really hard. And um, you're in those situations, and you just feel like you can't respond um, because then you're kind of seen as as the angry black woman, and you don't want to do that. And that's um, and you, for them, represent the entire race. Yes, yes. and it was, it was a lot of pressure. And so I knew that in the moment when that happened that I couldn't respond in the way that I wanted to. Um, and it was very conflicting and upsetting for me. Um, I actually ended up having several panic attacks over it um, because of the fact that like, I just felt so out of control. Um, and I felt so disrespected and I felt that no one was ever going to understand what I had been through. So, um, but it definitely, it definitely happens and it's, it's happened a few times, um, when I was one, when I was younger and then one, um, when I was in college. And so, um, I was definitely more aware of it in college. Um, when I was younger, I think I was kind of just like, who says that type of thing? Um, I ended up getting a penalty afterwards. I punched the person, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it definitely happens. Um, and it's, it's a sad fact, but it, it still, it still exists. Yeah. Um, why, why do you think, I mean, do you see, um, you know, in the future of hockey and, and things like that, do you see African-Americans participating more? I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting thing um, seem like baseball used to be Mm -hmm. a lot but now it seems to be on the downhill hockey seems to be you know a little bit here and there but yeah um, do do you do you see anything in in how the nhl or um other organizations are approaching um being more available to the minority population? Yeah, I think um, specifically when it comes to the NHL, I think they created um, before COVID happened was kind of like this tour that they were doing around, um, they created a bus and they were gonna do like a Black History Month um, 
education um, and they were taking it all across the different um, locations and different teams and areas that were very, um, that needed a lot of attention. Um, and I thought that was a great first step, but it definitely needed to be more. Um, I think they have created programs in underprivileged um, areas to create access for hockey. Um, because as, as I said before, it's a white man's sport and it's very, very expensive. Um, there's nothing cheap about hockey, um, unfortunately. And so a lot of people um, there alone don't have access to it. Um, I think in terms of the NHL and other sports, I think there needs to be a lot more representation, um, whether that's at the coaches level, the players level, um, because it's hard for these young kids for people to come in and just teach them how to play hockey. But then if they don't have that representation and someone to look up to, they're never going to pursue it. Um, and I think the other thing that's really interesting in the black community is that so often it's not a sport that we get pushed to. Um, so often you either get pushed to track or you get pushed to football or basketball. Yep. Um, one, because they're cheap and they're not expensive to participate in. Um, they're easy to kind of go outside and play with your friends and get better at it. Um, the access to the sport is a lot easier to access, but um, I think that's another thing is the fact that it's hard to push people towards those, um, those opportunities if they don't see themselves there. Yeah. And I think there's very few players, whether that's at the college level, the professional level, um, coaching level, people coaching these players, it's, um, I've never had a black coach. Um, I, and it took a very long time. Um, I think after eight years of playing, it was the first time I'd ever seen a female coach. Um, and so that was a great adjustment for me because I didn't always get along with my male coach because he just didn't understand me. Yeah. And I was the only female in a male, um, male sport. So I think there's a lot of steps that need to be taken. Um, I think first the NHL needs to address the fact that there's racism still existing within their sport and it happens. And there's a lot of, um, I think they referred their minor league players that are dealing with it. There was a Players Tribune um, article that came out that somebody wrote about, which is um, very great. And I, I thought it was super powerful and moving to the fact that he felt that um, he could come forward and speak up. Um, and I think, yeah, so I think there's a lot of steps to be made and I think they're starting to make them, but it can't just be an, a, a one month thing. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna encourage people to play hockey in February because it's Black History Month. Yeah. Talk to me about, um, you know, what, like you're, as you're going through high school, um, at some point, you know, you realize you're pretty good and, and colleges are, are recruiting. Talk about that process. Um, why did you choose uh, BC? What were some other schools maybe involved in it? Yeah, um, I was fortunate enough to get, um, I was approached by a number of different organizations, sorry. Um, a few of them Ivy League, those were ruled out because I didn't want that pressure on myself in terms of school. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't the type of person that was that dedicated to school. And so, um, I knew I wanted to be in the Boston area. I was able to go to Boston when I was very young. Um, and so I was able to experience that. And, then, and my best friend growing up um, was actually from Boston. She had moved to California um, at a very young age. And so we always talked about how we wanted to go to school together in Boston and all this stuff. So um, I was certainly drawn towards Boston. I would say my last few schools that I was looking at was um, Boston, Boston College, Northeastern, um, UNH, and then I also looked at BU, um, Boston University. Um, in terms of UNH, that was ruled out because it was too far and too secluded for me. Um, it was a huge campus. That was when I first realized that I wanted to be on a smaller campus. Yeah. Um, and so that also eliminated at the same time BU because it was so large and I didn't want to be in the city um, that much. Um, and so my final two were Northeastern and Boston College. Um, I actually went on to Northeastern's campus and I loved it. Um, I loved how small it was. 
Um, I love the idea of the co-op program. I liked that it was near the city. Um, it was a little hectic, but I, I, I love the school and um, love the campus. Um, and then I went to BC the next day um, and I just fell in love with it. Um, being on campus there is beautiful, it was secluded, it was small enough, as you know, it's just, it's an amazing school. Um, they had an education department that I wanted to be a part of um, and to learn through there. And so, and on top of that, they were one of the top teams in the nation. So it really just all came together. Um, but I just, I stepped on BC's campus and I just loved it. Talk about um, being at BC. What was the journey like as a, as a student athlete? Um, maybe what were some of the struggles and what were some of the good parts? Yeah, um, I really enjoyed being a student athlete at BC. Um, I think it gave us this unique opportunity and a platform to be um, good representation and good students to set a good example. Um, I think the stat is there was one in 16 student athletes for a regular student there. Um, and so I had a great experience with the fact that the athletic department set up so many opportunities for us to give back in the local community and get to know other um, teams and that sort of stuff. And so um, I had a great experience there. And then in terms of uh, bad, I wouldn't say there wasn't necessarily anything bad. Um, I think there are a few moments here and there that I personally struggled with um, that I wish would have been handled a little different um, within my coaches and my um, local support system. Um, but overall, I had a great experience being there. Um, I really took it on my personal um, goal was to meet new people and meet people outside of the athletic department and make friends with other students um, because it's so easy to get wrapped up into that bubble of athletics and um, especially when one in 16 students are student athletes, they're, they're everywhere you go. And so um, I wanted to make sure that I was included and that I got the full experience of being just a student there. Um, that was something that my mom not harped on, but really wanted me to make sure of that, like, if I was going to a school, it was it going to be somewhere that I could see myself at, if for some reason, uh, hockey wasn't going to work out, or I had an injury, and I had to go be a regular student. Yeah. Um, and so that was really important to her. And it became very important to me and adamant to me, when I got on campus, and I wanted to make sure that I was engaging with other students and making friends outside of my bubble. How do we increase the popularity of women's ice hockey? Um, there were times, I'll, I'll give a personal story, I was working for the athletic department uh, on a Friday night and you guys were like the number one or number two team in the nation. And, and we were looking at like, you know, a hundred people at the game. And then the next day, you know, BC men's hockey is, you know, probably top 25, but stadiums filled. Um, I'd look at, you know, some of the women's uh, college basketball teams um, like Coach Staley and, and, and University of South Carolina and, and things like that. And, you know, someone that wasn't traditionally like a UConn, but has built the popularity of the, of the game. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um... That is a, that's a great question and I don't necessarily have an answer, but I think it comes down to the fact of um, women's hockey just isn't as respected as men's hockey in general. Um, I think that is something that um, not only the PWPH, PWHPA, sorry, I always say it wrong, and the NWHL are both fighting for um, is to get that representation into um, get people exposed to women's hockey. I think um, in terms of the Olympics, when they won in the last Olympic um, go around, I think that gave a lot of people a lot of exposure and a lot of momentum towards it. Um, and I think that is definitely gonna help when you see it on a national level and seeing people more engaged. And I think it also comes down to access of the fact that um, women's hockey just wasn't on TV. and. Um, there was young girls that weren't having access to go to games or to see it on TV and see the representation. And so um, 
I don't know if I, I necessarily have an answer, but I think yeah, it's a tough question. I, I admit yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's important. Yeah. I think the most important thing is to just put as much effort into as you're doing on the men's side to put in the same effort as you are in terms of marketing or whatever it may be on the women's. Yeah. Talk to me about, uh, you know, the NWHL. Um, when did that come into your mind? Um, talk maybe a little bit about the formation of that to, to people that don't know about it um, and, and your, you know, your thoughts on the league and what your experience was. Yeah, um, the NWHL is the National Women's Hockey League. Um, it was formed when I was a senior, so 2016. Um, it was very new and they were working things out and they, they gained a lot of momentum, which was great that first year um, because they had all of the best players in the world playing, um, especially the U.S. players um, playing and they had access and they were getting um, playing in um, areas in which there was excitement around women's hockey. So Boston, New York, um, Connecticut, and then um, Buffalo, New York, which was building up their women's program. Um, so when I was a senior, I kind of hockey had ended for us and um, my college career had ended and um, I was going back and forth on whether or not I wanted to go home or if I wanted to stay here, um, if I wanted to continue to play. Um, I knew I wasn't ready to give up hockey. Um, and so then I decided that I wanted to stay in the Boston area. Um, there was a draft that happened. I think it was Technically, it was the first draft um, because the first year people had just signed. The second year was the first draft. And so I had a few teammates that were drafted. Um, I wasn't drafted, so I just signed. Um, I ended up signing with the Connecticut Whale. Um, I stayed and lived in Boston, so I, I drove um, twice a week, um, three times, including games to Connecticut. Um, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, it was tough, yes. Um, I, was, I was dedicated, and there just wasn't – um, a spot opener, an opportunity for the team in Boston. So I went with my next best option. Um, and I actually had um, two of my teammates that were drafted were drafted to Connecticut. So we just ended up carpooling together, which is great. Yeah. Um, in terms of the experience, it was great to see so many people in the, um, just the fans that were dedicated to um, growing women's hockey and supporting us. Um, it was a great experience to have fans that were fans of the women's hockey only, not only, but they were huge fans of women's hockey, especially our league. Um, and so it was great to see that and to see how much it had grown in Buffalo, New York. And they became, um, they ended up later being um, bought by the, the same owners who own the Buffalo Sabres, which is the NHL team. And they really built that up. Um, and to see the NHL teams kind of supporting them um, in whatever the ways they could, which was great. Um, I had a good experience in the NWHL. Um, it was a great time. Um, I appreciated the fact that I was able to continue my career and to play um, for people um, and fans that wanted to, to come watch women's ice hockey. Yeah. Um, talk to me, I guess, um, What's what's your what's your favorite part about hockey? What's what's talk about the joys and 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 some of the maybe the things you don't like, but talk about the love of the game. Yeah. Um, so my favorite part about hockey is just like feeling the cold air on my face when I'm skating. Um, I was known for my fast skating. Um, I love the competition of it. I was nat naturally um, a competitive person, and so. Um, I loved that aspect and um, just being out there was so freeing for me um, and it was so different than what I grew up with, um, what my mom played, what my what my siblings um, played and so um, it was just a different challenge and I picked it up very easily which I also enjoyed. Um, I struggled with other sports and it was very frustrating to me at times but um, I enjoyed, I just, I just loved being on the ice and skating and um, being out there with my friends. 
What I didn't enjoy was getting up super early. <laughs> yeah. um, I, as you can see, I'm always cold, which is funny because I, I play in an ice rink and people are always like, how did you, how are you always cold? You played hockey for like 25 years. And so I was just like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I think I had a great time with traveling with friends, going to see new areas, play other teams from other parts of the country, um, getting to know other people that I kind of, when you make friends in a sport, you kind of, on other teams and other places of the country, you, you make friends and then you get to see them and watch their career develop and end up playing them in college. Um, I love that. And so it was just a lot of fun. I, I made a lot of great friends um, through hockey and I learned a lot about myself as well. Yeah. Um, what would you say, uh, say there's a, a high school um, hockey player watching this, um, what advice would you give to her about, I mean, um, you know, making it to the collegiate level and then to the professional level? Um, what were the things that made you um, such an accomplished athlete? Yeah, I think um, the immediate thing that comes to my head is um, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Um, being dedicated, taking those moments um, when you're not playing in the summer to go out in your front yard and practice or um, go shoot in your backyard or whatever it may be. Um, I think dedication goes a long way to the sport and working hard will go a very long way. Um, putting in the long hours, whether that's in the gym, whether that's in the rink or whatever it may be, or um, sharpening up those small skills. Um, I think it's also important to know to not be afraid of the things you aren't good at. Um, focus on your weaknesses, um, try and build them up because they're only weaknesses until you build them up and they become strengths. Yeah. Um, and I think getting yourself out there, um, going to play in tournaments, challenging yourself. Um, I often always play to level up because I like the challenge. And so um, whether I didn't wanna be complacent, you can't be complacent to want to then play in Division One college hockey or even D3, um, you have to be able to um, dedicate yourself in a different way um, and take that extra step and do that extra sprint or whatever it may be um, to make yourself and build yourself up mentally and physically so you can set yourself apart. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, what what do you hope for the vision of of the game um five ten years from now uh and things like that yeah that's a great question um i think for myself in terms of hockey in general i would love to see um it displayed more um whether that's on tv or getting um local channels with the college games um, I'd love to see more of the NWHL and the PWPA, PWHPA um, on TV and just for that representation to be more out there and so people can become more aware of, um, of the game. I think in terms of the Olympics, they did a great job of publicizing it and making sure that people had access to watch that game because it was an incredible game. Um, players from both the U.S. and Canada um, coming together to showcase their sport, and they did an amazing job of that. Um, and the second piece I would say is I'd love to see more representation in terms of minorities. Um, I know that when I was playing, I was very excited to see another Black player. Um, and when I started coaching after I was done playing, I was always very excited to coach um, a young black girl or a young black boy that was interested in playing hockey. And um, I was excited, but I also hated that feeling at the same time of that, oh, I finally see another person that looks like me. And um, I'm excited to see that one person out of the 30 kids on the ice. Um, that shouldn't be the feeling. There should be yeah. um, more kids out there, um, whatever race it is, but um, more minorities out there playing the game. And I think that's how we're gonna diversify. And I think that's how you get more people involved and see more representation as they start to grow up and there's more representation on the, on the higher level. Um, those would be my two things that I'd love to see is the, the game showcase the way it deserves um, and to see uh, more minorities get involved because I love the game and I played it for so long. 
Um, and I would love to see more little, um, little black girls that play it and love it just as much as me. Yeah. Um, now that you're looking back, um, say, you know, there's a, there's a sophomore in college, uh, you know, a division one player watching this. Um, is there anything you would do differently? Is there anything that you would tell them, like, make sure to do this or make sure to, you know, that, if I had it again, I, I would definitely take advantage of this or something like that. Yeah, I think um, the biggest thing is taking advantage of what's around you. Um, like I said earlier, that I really took advantage of the whole school um, and the people around me that weren't athletes. Um, a lot of my teammates didn't do that. And um, I think while they did have a good experience in college, I think they probably could have had an even better experience um, if they got to know the other people in their classes or um, um, just got to know the students and heard other perspectives um, because that's how I grew a lot was meeting people that weren't like me and that I learned a lot from them. Um, the second piece is, is as a student athlete, I think there's a great athletic department. Um, they do so much for the student athletes and they have so many resources. Um, and so, as you know, from working in the athletic department, then I ended up interning after I graduated. Um, I got to know them on a different level and see how dedicated they are. Um, and a few of those people have helped me in terms of looking for jobs and all that stuff. So my biggest thing is take advantage of the resources around you. Um, and I think networking is a huge thing and getting to know um, people, your peers, as well as alum, because um, I get it a lot now where people are just reaching out to me to see if I have a connection. And I usually do. Yeah. Um, BC or any college is very connected. Um, so getting to know the alums and seeing how they can help you. If they, they hear that you're from your school, they're going to want to help you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think um, networking and taking advantage of your, your surroundings. Yeah. Um, you're, you're someone that has written a, a good amount about mental health. You have your own website. Um, can you talk about that journey? Um, you know, you, you talked a little bit about it, um, you know, with panic attacks and things like that. Um, when did it start being a part of your life that um, you started to become aware of you know, that mental health was something affecting you? Yeah, so um, it became very apparent in my life um, when I was a sophomore. Um, I wasn't sleeping. I was crying for no reason. Um, I was like pretty much... Hmm? High school or college? Oh, yes, college. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yes, sophomore in college, um, it became very apparent. Um, there was, I don't know if you've read my blog, but there was a, a time in my sophomore year where I was at my lowest point um, in terms of mentally, physically, I was just tired and I couldn't do it. Um, and we were going on an away trip to Maine. Um, I don't remember any of it. I, I couldn't tell you what happened. I couldn't tell you how I played. I couldn't tell you what I ate, who I roomed with. It was just a very, very low point. Um, and that's when I started to recognize my mental health and um, decided to get help. Um, it definitely was an easy journey. And I had many conversations with therapists um, and psychologists, and they were, um, there were a few things that had happened in my life before that. I had just lost my grandmother, who I, I was in college. I just moved there. Um, the change of being in college, um, I never got to say goodbye to my grandmother. I had another family member earlier my sophomore year commit suicide. It was just, there was a lot of things that led up to it. And so yeah. through conversations, I actually realized that I had been dealing with depression since I was in high school. Um, I wanna say it was my sophomore year in high school because I, I was um, diagnosed as uh, having insomnia and I had to take medication to help me sleep at night. Um, and then, the medication was so strong that I was groggy throughout the day and I never wanted to leave my bed and it's just a, a ripple effect. And so um, in terms of my mental health, I, I became very aware of it my sophomore year. Um, my junior year, I continued to struggle with it. Um, and it, it 
came out a lot when I had when I had my injury where I had to get surgery um, for my head, um, not related to mental health, but a, another surgery. And so um, when I had to, I started medication and taking care of myself. But when I had surgery, I had to go off medication because they the blood clot reasons. Um, it it came back, and so it was it was very hard and. With the combination of that and not being able to play hockey at the time, um, I struggled a lot. But um, as sad as it is, and as much as I struggle as I look back, I wouldn't change any of it. Um, I think it's made me the person who I am and the advocate I am. I've, I've been able to help a few friends that um, have dealt with it personally, other teammates um, who have struggled to help them get through it and to help them get the help that they need. Um, so. I'm very thankful that um, of my depression, anxiety, and um, one of the biggest things that I say is that um, I don't have it, I live with it, um, because that was something that I had to learn was to live with it. It wasn't something that could just be fixed, unfortunately. It's not something that's just gonna go away. Some people do have seasonal depression, and it is, but for me, um, it's something that's very um, a part of my life and who I am, so. Um, naturally, I just became an advocate in, in helping others. What would you um, say to someone, whether they're an athlete or not, um, that may be going through something? Um, you know, what, what would your pieces of advice be, um, having gone through your own journey? Um, yeah. Um, I think it can be very lonely. Um, and the the crazy thing about it is, is that it's very easy to trick yourself and to convince yourself that you are alone. Um, and there are many, many, many times where I, I felt that I was truly alone. Um, even being surrounded by my teammates, whether that was in the locker room or whatever it may be. Um, but knowing that you aren't um, in that, people are there to support you. Um, getting help is very hard. It's a big, big step, um, but it's a very important step. Um, even if that's just telling a friend how you're truly feeling, um, that's telling the personal trainer how you feel, going to the ther therapy. Um, that is a big step, but it's a necessary step and it will, as long as you my thing is, is that as long as you're trying to make yourself better and not sit in the rut, then you will get through it. Um, lean on your support system. Um, I, I lean on my mom a lot and my, my closest friends who I didn't tell for years that I was struggling. Um, and so when it got to a point where I needed help, um, I was able to lean on them. And it was so great to know that they didn't look at me different and to um, know that they truly supported who I was as a person, all of me. Um, so I would say, don't be afraid to um, tell that person that you've been begging to tell or to even speak out, um, because it'll only get worse if you hold it in. Yeah, and I think it's great that, um, you know, I think a lot of people think accomplished people don't have mental health problems, but I think often they might be the ones most susceptible because they're so hard on themselves, they're so successful. Yeah in an endeavor, you know, like being a division one athlete and, and things like that, that they, you know, often don't want to seek the help or mm -hmm. seem weak um, and just that being okay. Um, yeah, um, I guess, was there anything else that um, you wanted to talk about? Um. I don't think so. I think um, I appreciate you sharing my story and giving me the platform to share all about myself and not just um, who I am as an athlete. Um, I think that's really important for people to know that, especially with everything going on right now, that people, um, especially with our, our Black athletes, that they're more than athletes. Um, they're people, they're human beings, they have feelings outside of their sport. Um, and so I, I appreciate you taking the time to get to know all of me and sharing that um, so people can kind of have that human aspect um, outside of just looking at the athlete and the person. Yeah, of course. Thank you for uh, being on, Kalia. I just, I mean, 
you know, obviously you're a very inspirational figure, Division One athlete and professional hockey player. Um, and uh, so, and, and someone that, uh, you know, has been vocal about being um, strong on mental health. I think that always inspires others to feel like it's okay. So I just yeah. want to commend you on that. Um, for anybody out there that wants to support you or, or reach out to you, how can they, how can they do so? Yeah, they can um, reach me on social media. Um, all of my social medias are uh, KLEAA42. Um, I'm always happy to answer. I'm happy to give anyone my number to talk or email or whatever it may be. So um, whatever you need, I'm here. I'm here to be that friend. So uh, please feel, don't be afraid to reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kalia. Thank you.